In the summer of 1989, I ran away from home to join a circus in Mexico. When I think back on this curious episode in my life, it seems to me like a really odd thing to have done. Because when I was a child growing up, I didn't really like circuses very much. I found them to be really rather sinister places. And um, <clears throat> I never enjoyed going to them at all. But I'd been commissioned to write a travel book about Mexico, and I needed to find a theme. And I was very enamored of the novels, the so-called magic realist novels of people like uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and, and so forth. And I took it into my head that what I would do in Mexico was to try to write a travel book that read like a novel. I wanted to write a book of real magic realism. And I um, went to my editor at the time and I pitched this idea to him and he really liked it, so that was absolutely great. So I bought myself a ticket to Mexico, Mexico City, and about two days before I was due to leave, I had to go into his office to sign the contract for this, for this book. And it was incredibly important that I got the contract signed before I left, because no contract, no money. And I was planning to be away for a year, so I really needed him to give me the money up front. And I remember going into his office, and um, there was the contract, and he had a pen in his hand, and I remember him leaning down to sign on the dotted line. And just before he did, he paused, and he looked up, and he said to me, by the way, I, I can't believe I've never asked you this before, but you have found a circus in Mexico, haven't you? So I lied, and I said, yes, of course, absolutely, I have. Don't worry, just, just sign, sign on the dotted line. And he did, and it was all fine. And every time I tell this story, I just have this horrible feeling that I'm going to look up, and my eyes are going to lock onto this same editor's eyes as I tell the story. Um, I do have one editor here, but not that one, luckily, so I'm all right still. So two days later, with the money in my pocket, or in my bank account anyway, I uh, went to Mexico City, without having found a circus. And I did what any sensible person does when they reach a foreign city and they don't know their way around. I got into a taxi. And I, <laughs> seems very, very amateur, doesn't it? And I said to the taxi driver, llévame al circo, por favor, take me to the circus, please. And this fantastic man in this incredibly bashed up old taxi took me for a whole day round some of the most peculiar reaches of Mexico City. And at the end of the day, I found my circus, Circo Bells. Circo Bells, this is what I absolutely loved about them. They took their name, apostrophe and all, B-E-L-L -L apostrophe S, from the label on a whiskey bottle. They called themselves after Bells Whiskey. <laughs> Why, I can't tell you, but they did. And um, the circus, when I knew it, was run by three brothers, the Bells brothers, they called themselves. This is quite an old photograph, taken in about late 19, um, 1950s, I would have thought. And there were three of them, as you can see. There was Mundo, Rolando, and uh, Jorge Bells. And it always seemed to me that they were rather like Russian dolls. Each one was sort of bigger and shinier than the one who came before. And they were trapeze artists, and they were the most extraordinary shape. They were almost as broad as they were high. They were practically square. And they had these enormous hands, which unfortunately you can't see in this photograph. They're hands as big as hams, absolutely giant hands. And they were very fantastic. They were the absolute toast of Mexican circus life, for reasons that are obvious if you look at this picture. Um, when I knew them, that uh, years had moved on a little bit, and there was only... <laughs> There was only one uh, who was still actually a circus performer, the man on the far right, uh, far right as you look, Mundo, trapeze artist. And on my first evening there, I went to the evening show. And, um, and after it was over, I said to somebody, uh, could I meet the jefe, could I meet the boss, please? And he said, yes, please, come this way. And I went round the back of the circus tent and through a little opening in the tarpaulin. And there were these amazing beings you know, with these swirling white and silver cloaks covered and these body stockings covered in silver sequins. 
And when they moved, it was an extraordinary thing that these puffs of white chalk came off them because they used chalk on their hands so that they wouldn't uh, slip during the trapeze act. And so they were like these extraordinary birds, incredibly exotic birds of paradise, sweeping you know, through the backstage area. And very nervously, I said, well, could I have a word? Yes, please, come this way. I'll take you to my office. His office was sort of broom cupboard at the back of the circus top, sat down. What can I do for you? And I then I had to give my pitch, I had to give my spiel, pitch the idea, and I came out with this incredibly <laughs> garbled, garbled thing. I'm a writer from England, a book about Mexico, magic realism, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, God knows what he thought of it. But he was a very, very courteous man, and he listened to me without any interruption, with his, hand, his head on one side, didn't interrupt me at all, and at the end, there was this tiny pause, and he had this habit of cracking his finger, his fingers like this. And so he sat there cracking his finger joints. And after a while, he just looked up and he said, so, when do you want to start? And that was how I came to spend four months of my life living and working with Circo Bells. Now, when I joined them, I had absolutely no thought in my head that I would do anything other than be an observer. I never thought I would take part in the circus as such, they had no idea that I wouldn't take part in the circus. For them, it was something, it was completely, it went without saying. No one even bothered to mention it because it was so obvious to them that if you went to the circus, what else were you going to do while you were there? And they said, don't worry, we've got an act for you. It's terribly easy. It's called aerial ballet. You just climb up a rope and um, do a few little figures at the top. <laughs> I was quite adventurous in those days, but I wasn't completely insane and uh, this took place about 20 feet off the floor. I did, I have to say in my own defense, I did give it, rather gamely give it a go, and I had a try, I didn't even get up the rope. I don't know when you last tried to just shin up a rope for 20 foot, it's fantastically difficult. It gives you the most terrible rope burns. And so eventually he said, oh, well, forget that. Uh, okay, we'll give you the dunce's job. There is one job that any idiot can do, and uh, we'll give this to you. You can ride Hannibal. So this was my night job, and I rode Hannibal. I rode Hannibal twice a day in the evening parades, uh, three times on Saturdays, and occasionally four times on Sundays, so they really got their money's worth out of me. And I have to say, it was the most fantastically un-PC thing you can possibly imagine. Animal rights, women's rights, there was really no um, defending it in any way. But it... <laughs> It was the best fun I've ever had in my whole life, with no exceptions whatsoever. And the thing that I'm very um, proud of is that I had my own billing. I was, no I was actually known as, I was known as La Gringa Estrella. Now, Gringa means foreigner. Estrella means star, but not in the sort of Hollywood sense of star. It means star as in a sort of sparkly person who doesn't wear very many clothes, but they've got a lot of sequins on them. <laughs> And it was very, very good fun. And I, one of the things that they had was this very, very, very bad tannoy system on a little truck. And this truck would go round the various venues where we were, and it would it, it announce the circus. And um, I, every so often, I, I could hear my name being called out in sort of varying degrees of being near and far. La gringa estrella, they would go like this, and, uh, and the other great thing was, uh, Katy, that's right, Katy, they, my, my name's Katie, but they used to call me Katy, Katy, la gringa estrella, and then el cir the circo bells, their great line was, el circo más famoso en todo los Americas, the most famous circus in the whole of the Americas, which of course, they weren't at all. Um, they, um, there was a kind of, kind of tinselly glamour about the whole thing, but the reality of this life was very, very different. And I put this picture in just to give you an idea of what it was like behind the scenes. Um, the circus had the same kind of problems as itinerant people anywhere in the world. So they were very much treated like outsiders and treated like gypsies and treated rather badly by the people in the places they went to. They were harassed, routinely harassed by the police. The boys were often picked on and beaten up but they were very, very doughty, and they kept 
things going and they kept their domestic lives going under the really very difficult um, conditions. Um, and I particularly admired the women because they work so hard. And this is a picture of Mara. This is the aerial ba ballista. This is her day job, washing clothes for her brothers and her father. Every drop of water that they used had to be lugged in buckets from a faraway tap. It was, was not, it was not an easy way of life. But the thing that kept them going was the fact they had this very, very strong family. And they were the brothers, they were the people who ran the circus, but really the real power behind the throne was this woman here, Doña Elena. She was the matriarch of their family. She didn't live at the circus anymore. She was in her 70s when this picture was taken. And she lived in Mexico City. She used to come on a Sunday to tell them all off. And her grandchildren, who were a very um, sparky lot, would try to sweeten her temper by buying her ice cream. Um, it never did any good, she told them off anyway. But she was an amazing woman. She had been married at 14 at gunpoint. This is a peculiarly Mexican story. And to a man that she claims to have absolutely hated all her life. But she nonetheless went on and had 13 children by this man. So something worked somewhere along the line. And uh, it was these 13 children who made up the circus at various times. And when I was there, it was their grandchildren who were the, mostly the circus performers. And they started very young. This one is Lely. She was the youngest when I was there. She is the daughter of the trapeze artist who I showed you earlier. She was just three when this picture was taken, learning how to be a clown. Um, I love this picture. The, the circus was the actual people of the, of the family, the so-called Bells family, but it also incorporated a, a kind of wider family. It's something of a cliché to say that circus people, or the circuses are full of runaways and orphans and dispossessed people of various kinds, but this is absolutely true in the case of Circo Bells. And it was quite a good symbiosis, really, because the circus couldn't afford to pay very much to people, and these kids really um, had were street children some of them or they'd been kicked out of home or they'd come out of jail or there was some reason why they had nowhere else to go and the circus gave them a job and it gave them a roof over their heads and it also gave them this very strong sense of community it was a ferociously loyal pack really that we traveled with and that's what kept them going and kept them safe there was a lot of sex in the circus a lot of the boys had run away to the circus because they'd fallen in love with one of the girls, or, and occasionally vice versa. And I used to think that it was a really good thing because it helped them to transcend this life that was really quite tough and quite brutal at times. The book that I wrote at the end, after my whole year in Mexico, um, didn't turn out to be at all the book that I thought it was going to be for a start. I thought that I could travel with them for the whole year and I could see the rest of Mexico when I was doing it, but that was impossible because while I was with the circus, I could have been traveling in Timbuktu and it wouldn't have made any difference at all. It was so absorbing being there and listening to the stories of the people. And that's what the book very largely became. And I put this picture in because their story is particularly remarkable. Ilish and Olga. Ilish had been... had been orphaned very young, gone on the streets, been put in jail. He was very good at fighting. And the prison guards where he, were, uh, where he was in the prison in northern Mexico ran him as a prize fighter, as a business venture in the, from the prison where he, he, he was. Um, prize fighting. You know, the Mexicans don't have a terribly high notion of health and safety, but even in Mexico, prize fighting is illegal because it's so brutal but he somehow survived it and later came to be with the circus and he got together with this remarkable child, really, this sort of child bride, this tiny little soft-spoken girl who always wore immaculate white. God knows how she did that. But I was always particularly struck by their stories and it's a very somehow very typical of circus stories. I'm going to end with this picture. This girl is my greatest, dearest friend in the circus. She was the aerial ballet girl. Her name is Mara. Just before I left Mexico, uh, after a year, they asked me to be a godmother at their wedding, these two people. Mexicans have matrimonial godparents as well as baptismal godparents, um, which I did with great pleasure. And I love to think 
and it gives me however far away I am geographically from them, and however many years have gone by, there's still a little link that I have with this wonderful world. Thank you. <laughs>